Welcome to Canonical, a conversation about books. I'm James Xiao, and I'm joined by Sam Spieler. Hi. Hello, Sam. And Yad Daris. Hello. Hi. All right. So today we are discussing the third book in our contemporary Japanese fiction miniseries, Yoko Tawada's award-winning speculative fiction novel, The Emissary, which was published in the UK as The Last Children of Tokyo. As always, you don't have to read the book to follow our discussion, but we think you'll enjoy it more if you have read it already. So, Ian, this was your pick for our series. Can you tell us something about the author and why you chose this book? Yeah. uh, Yoko Tawada, the author, is a novelist, poet, and translator. Uh, She writes in Japanese and German, and sometimes she uses both languages in the same work. She calls this process continuous translation. She left her native Japan in the 1980s to study German literature in Europe, and she's been living in Berlin since 2006. As you might expect from a translator novelist, her work plays with language a lot in a way that reminds me a lot of Vladimir Nabokov, but she also plays with absurdity and anthropomorphism. This is the first of Tawada's uh, novels that I've read, But actually, since I finished reading this novel, I read two more, because they're all quite short. I really like all of them. I first noticed her in my local bookshop several years ago. I noticed that her work was published on New Directions, a publisher that I trust for serious fiction. And I forgot about her for a while. And then when I saw her name again, and I saw that she had won both the National Book Award in 2018 For this novel, and also the Akutagawa Award for The Bridegroom Was a Dog, I knew I shouldn't keep putting off reading her work, and I'm I'm glad I finally read some of her work. So did this novel live up to your expectations then? I had high hopes. I read a couple of the blurbs on the book, and I was excited by the publisher, and the premise of the book seemed appealing to me. It was actually much better than I thought it would be. I was really pleasantly surprised. I think it only got like 3.5 stars on Goodreads. Yeah, I don't really trust Goodreads very much. I feel like I trust myself more than anybody else. Well, that's good. I, yeah. Yeah. I know why. I, I think I can understand. I know we're going to talk about it. I think I can understand why it got a low rating or a low-ish rating. But, yeah, that exact reason is one of the reasons why I wouldn't trust Goodreads. This was so good. So what did you think about it? I absolutely loved it. I uh, kept writing things down, marking little passages, and I don't do that for every book. Uh, I don't, I very rarely do that. Uh, I was jotting down notes on quotes and... Uh, there's all these little lovely, what I would call wag the dog sentences, where the turns of phrases that aren't very, they're not normal, and it just made for lovely reading. Yeah, I thought this was a great pick, Ian. Yeah, Sam, I totally agree. Um, I don't know if it's a writer thing, you know, like both of us like the same parts of the book but for me the writing is so so good like yeah. especially uh in the in my version of the book i think it's page 64 um it's it is so good like that's one part that i highlighted that's the section i know we all have different copies probably but that's the section where he talks about um marika's pregnancy so his wife's pregnancy and mm-hmm. he compares um, having children to seeing an ice cream maker in the department store and how like he and Marika are the ingredients that you put in on top and then the ice cream comes out below. I mean, that passage <laughs> yeah. is just, it is so good because it is so good because it ends with him saying every time he thought over this process, he realized anew that he had not been the chef, but the ingredients that's that's what makes it so good because without Mm -hmm. that sentence the whole passage is just him making 
a simile, right? But that passage right. ties it to the whole book. Like it's about him not being in control. So um, yeah, there's just so many passages that are fantastic. So I completely agree. Like from just looking at how it's done, the craft is like near perfect in my yeah. opinion. Yeah, so definitely more than 3.5 stars for me. Possibly even a 4 star. Ooh. Yeah, yeah. high praise. One of, the, one of the first things I wrote down was um, when Yoshiro's hand turns his own face away from Mume's uh, eating, when he can't stand to watch Mume eating. And it's not his, ha- it's not his face that's turning it away. It's that his hand is turning his face away and there's all sorts of things like that where it's just so playful and and inventive and uh standing everything on its head and inviting the reader to go along with it so before we get too far into the weeds here's a quick summary set in the dystopic near future Japan, and maybe the whole world, has undergone a series of nebulously defined catastrophes. As a result of this, Japan has literally and figuratively distanced itself from the outside world. And in this chaotic setting, the centenarian writer Yoshiro cares for his school-aged great-grandson, Mumei, who, like all his peers, suffer from a litany of health complications. Mume is chosen later in the book by a secretive underground sect to go abroad as an emissary. So I guess the first thing I want to talk about is, uh, just so we're on the same page, do we think that the rest of the world has suffered a similar catastrophe? I'm not sure. Yeah, it's, it's really vague. It seems like things there might be things that are affecting the other countries, but maybe I get the sense not necessarily as bad as Japan. Yeah. I feel like there are a variety of catastrophes happening simultaneously, but I think that each Mm. society probably is facing unique challenges. Yeah. The way the book is set up, we actually get almost nothing about the outside world and we get kind of a callback to the Edo period, right? where um, mm-hmm. Japan kind of sort of self-imposed, had a, yes, right, right. had a self-imposed isolationist policy. So that's kind of the um, comparison that I think was being drawn here, that this is a self-imposed isolation policy. We know, but it's not explained. Right. We know that there are some superpowers that still exist that, uh, it sounds like the the BRICS nations, like um, India and South Africa, are doing okay, and they're exporting their culture and language. Yeah, we don't we don't know much more than that. Uh, we talked in a previous episode about convenience store women in our Japanese mini series. Um, how it felt more like a short story or a novella than a novel. Did you find The Emissary to be the same? I didn't. I felt like this was much more complex than Convenience Store Woman. Uh, I had previously mentioned that I distinguish a short story and a novella and a novel, not just by the length, but by the complexity of the plot. And this novel, I think, is so much more ornate even though in terms of things actually happening fewer things really seem to happen the amount of ideas and the amount of description are such that it's much more present in my mind as i'm reading it than convenience store woman was you have to pay a lot more attention to what's happening in this book the plot quote-unquote plot is pretty linear most of it just takes place in a day, but it deals so much with the past. Well, I agree with you, Sam. I think that when I was reading this novel, there was always a sense of 
instability, if I could describe the act of reading in that way, with a novel like Convenience Store Woman, I always felt like I had both feet on the ground and I didn't have to work too hard to follow the prose as it moved through description. But with this novel, because things are introduced so quickly and it's just like one idea into another idea and not really feeding back always into the main idea, you really have to pay attention. It's much more active reading. Did you feel the way I did where a lot of the language creates this kind of fever dream world where it's difficult to tell what is literal and what is figurative? Yeah, I would say that that's, that's similar, yeah. I definitely did. So to your point about complexity, Ed, I felt that uh, Convenience Store Woman kind of struck just one note, you know, like a tuning mm -hmm. fork, whereas this mm. is much more of a composition where it hits different notes, but all throughout, Tawada is layering tension because we know how much... Uh, Yoshiro cares for um, Mume. So we know how much Yoshiro cares for Mume, but at every instance, we're given some reason to worry about Mume. And we, f we really feel that worry. So that tension kind of gets layered more and more. Like when Marika says uh, that she's considering nominating him for that emissary program. You know, like, that's a huge blow. Like, when I read that, I was like, oh, man. Like, there's so much at stake here. I think that's one of the key strengths of this novel, yeah. is that Tawada does a really good job at layering that tension. I think, very quickly, just to kind of cap this off, one of the reasons why this novel functions differently from Convenience Store Woman is that the, the tension of Convenience Store Woman, I think uh, Murata requires the the reader to understand that tension it's not built into the novel but Murata is expecting the reader to understand the tensions of working life and the tensions of being a woman in modern society whereas with this novel i think that because it's very speculative and it's describing a world quite different from our own she has to be much more explicit with the layering of the tension she has to kind of build it into the novel because we don't know it. She can't assume that we understand the tension as it is. The aims are completely different, too. I mean, the, the characterization here, you're supposed to really care about Yoshiro and Mume in a much more deep way, I think, than, than Murata probably cares about you feeling for, um, is it Keiko? Yeah. Yeah, Keiko. Um, Keiko, I think she probably does want you to feel something for Keiko, but the whole point of that character is that she's this outsider, that which we talked about. That makes that, that tension a lot harder to, to strike. With all that said, I actually don't know if this is a novel, though. Um, for me, I, I don't think there's enough of a plot movement for me to really consider. I mean, this isn't to denigrate the work, because I don't think short stories are less meaningful than novels or novellas. I, this feels like a novella to me, actually. I feel that way because of the ending. I think that if the ending was fleshed out a bit more uh, with maybe... If it was maybe a third longer, actually, or maybe not even a third, but like a fourth or a fifth longer, I would have um, felt that it was more novel-like. Right now, it just it really does feel like a novella to me. Because um, did you guys feel like, was this, in terms of the present day, was this just like Mume wakes up, that's the first page, and then he goes to school? Right? It's like a, maybe a three-hour segment of, pre quote, present day. Yeah, I think the whole book, except for the end, takes place in a single day besides the memories and the you know, nostalgic sections. Yeah, and the end that you're talking about is um, it jumps forward in time about eight years, yeah. I think, seven, eight years. Yeah. 
it's interesting to me that you two bothered to kind of unpack the the time frame of this because I kind of was willing to just go along with the, the kind of fever dream as Sam described it. Like I didn't really bother to figure out how long this was actually taking place in quote unquote real time. It didn't seem significant to me. Yeah, I actually don't think it's significant. Yeah. Mm. It's I think it yeah. more just created a structure for the writer i don't yeah I, I don't think it's really that important for the reader uh, it was more just kind of a fascination that i had when i realized maybe halfway or maybe even more maybe two-thirds of the way through that oh wait we're still in the, the single day it, yeah it, it was yeah. it just was more like a dawning on me rather than a endeavoring to figure that out i mean that's what makes it good or makes it interesting is that it is quote a single day but i get the feeling every single day is the same it's exactly mm. like that um but at the same time the fact that every single day is the same is not true mm -hmm. because obviously horrific things are happening so <laughs> um it's this weird tension where every day feels mundane but at the same time around the corner something terrible could happen yeah that actually reminds me of when I realized that it was a single day. I think it was when uh, it was quite far into it. When we switched to Mume's point of view, which is about two thirds of the way through the book. And suddenly we see how much he's struggling to get into his clothes. Mm -hmm. um, and it hit me that that's the way the novel began before it quickly shifted to Yoshiro's point of view. Yeah, that passage where he's struggling to put his pants on and he imagines that his legs are octopus legs is yes. just really wonderful. It's just so well written. And I think the part that I found disjointing is when Tawada simultaneously describes Marika's visit from her point of view and then his, Yoshiro's point of view and then back to her point of view and then back to Yoshiro's point of view in the span of like five pages. Mm -hmm. I actually found that very uh, disorienting. And I don't even know if I like it, but because so much of the book kind of jumps around, I went along with it. But I'm not sure I like it because it did take me out of the story. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It didn't bother me too much. One of the things I'm curious about is that Yoshiro isn't unique in the book in his role as a caregiver to his great-grandchild. Uh, it sounds like all of Mume's classmates are cared for in the same way, uh, not by their parents, but by their great-grandparents or possibly grandparents. What is Tawada communicating here, do you think? Uh, for me, I see this as an overall symptom of a chaotic world. Um, it's not only chaotic in terms of the physical world and nature being kind of poisoned and people's bodies falling apart, but also social and familial relations are breaking down. And it's very notable to me that it seems like there are a lot of absent parents in this novel. And I think it's interesting that you have a certain generation of people who are the healthiest the very old people, and those are also the people who are very willing to care for others in their family. And as people get younger, they seem less attached to the other people in their society or in their family. So I think it's a perhaps a kind of social commentary or at least a social theme in which it seems that people in this world are increasingly disinterested in family life and unwilling to care for other people. Do you think that's a comment on current society? It might not be criticism in terms of Tawada saying something about contemporary Japan, but I think that it's just part of this world that she's built, that people are more and more uninterested in their families. I think that this is something we can talk more about later on, but I think it's significant that uh, Marika, she has her child, and then... She leaves the home, and even though she has her child, she's much more closely attracted to the people that she meets in the cafe. And she creates this habit of going to cafes to meet with other people who are 
strangers in the sense that they're not family members, but she has a much stronger bond with them, even though they're not family members, and she is, she eventually becomes estranged from her husband. Marika is kind of an interesting character in that she seems like she cares quite a bit for Yoshiro and Mumei in her own way, but mm -hmm. like you say, she she is very absent from them most of the time and seems like she cares more about not just the people she meets in the cafe, but then later in her emissary program, her, I guess her subversive way of, of trying to build Japan back up to what it used to be. Yeah. I think that this is, at least to me, I wouldn't go so far as to say that this is what Tawada is thinking, but I think it is kind of representative of something that's happening in our own real world, where people are often so concerned with society and so concerned with the world at large and thinking globally that they don't really pay attention to their own private lives and their relationships with friends and families as much as they should. I agree, but I look at it a little bit differently. I think they represent two different approaches toward healing or coping. Uh, Yoshiro is much more focused on family, that personal touch, whereas Marika is much more focused on political concerns, uh, mm. being a social activist. Like, they're both doing the same thing in a way. They're both trying to take care of the world, or at least the world around them, mm. but they're focused on different things. Uh, which is interesting. She's the only person who gives us that kind of perspective aside from Yoshiro, right? In the book, she's the only other point of view besides Yoshiro and Mume. And yeah. so I think that's interesting that she is still, quote, a good person. She's still working toward something that you might consider to be uh, honorable, but she is not focused on family. But then we also have their daughter who moves to Okinawa and kind of separates herself from the rest of her family and isn't really in touch. Like they send postcards very irregularly, it seems. And then her children, um, what is his name? Tomo, I think, and Tomo. his Tomo. wife. Yeah. yeah. Like they're the very bum. much, they're <laughs> bums. And they like, they have very little interest in caring for their child at all. So it seems like... A slippery slope, and I don't know if this is really what I want to say Tawada is making as an argument in the novel, but rather this is the way that I react to it. I do see it as perhaps a breakdown in familial relations. Well, that leads sort of into my next question. Speaking of Marika and her, her goals, her aims, at the end of the novel, we get a few paragraphs where we see Mumei has been chosen as the emissary and he's starting to leave on his journey. But the last paragraph or so, it gets very, very feverish. Uh, and so I, I was curious how you interpret those last few paragraphs of the novel. I interpreted it as, um, there's a jump forward in time, a flash forward, but it happens because Mume has, I guess, a stroke, um, but it has some kind of uh, health reaction, um, has some kind of health issue pop up. And because of that, he passes out and then he wakes up you know, eight years in the future. You could conceivably say that none of that actually happened that this was just all a dream, um, but you, you could, and I prefer to understand it as it actually did flash forward. And then at the end, it, it's a metaphoric flashing back to him being eight years old. Though you could read it as him dying, I guess. You could read it as him drowning in the tides. I'm kind of with you that I'm on team flash forward. Like, it definitely could be a dream, but I enjoy the reading where it's a flash forward more. So I'm inclined to go with what I enjoy more. I'm not sure if I agree with you that it's a flashback at the very end. I think it's obscure, but I think it's 
it's still enjoyable even if it's obscure. Like, I don't know what to think, but it doesn't bother me. I think it presents two possible readings and reactions. If it's a flashback, then it's him returning back to Yoshiro. He gets seven or eight years more with his great-grandfather, who he loves and who loves him. Because once he becomes an emissary, he probably won't return to Japan. Uh, so that's actually like a positive reading because it's him returning back where he can be with Yoshiro. Uh, because so much of the book is through Yoshiro's point of view. Him leaving is a tragedy, right? Mm. But if it's uh, not a flashback, then it's kind of signaling to me that this is the end. It's, it's the metaphor. Like it, it kind of reads like he's drowning, but it's, it is metaphorically the end of his life in Japan because he's leaving the shore. Okay. Right? He's going to another country. Well, this brings up a question that I have for both of you because I think, James, your opinion is quite different from mine. Do you see this emissary program as a good thing or a bad thing? Um, I don't have an opinion on the emissary program, actually. I don't see it as a good thing or a bad thing. I don't, I don't even really know like what the point of it is. I guess it's to be studied by other people in other countries. Like They're supposed to be test subjects. Well, Sam, what do you think? I am kind of with James on this. I, it's, it's kind of nebulous about w what the point of mm -hmm. the program is. But yeah, I think they're being tested, which makes me think that the things that are happening in Japan are possibly more extreme than the rest of the world. Uh, I think there was some line that mentioned that they wanted to test the children of Japan in case things like this happen elsewhere. Uh, so I, I don't know if it's a good or a bad thing. It's definitely against Japan's wishes, Japan, the state, but Marika and her institute are doing what they think is right in trying to connect with the outside world. And even though, like you say, this is the end of the novel is it signals the end or it can signal the end of Mume's life in Japan and possibly his life in general. There is a positive note to it that his life might be extended by leaving Japan uh, even though it means rigorous testing and poking and prodding. Uh, I, I want to hear your opinion, Ed, but I just want to very quickly say that it seems to me that Tawanda is anti-isolationist because Yoshiro is anti-isolationist, and we very much uh, sympathize and empathize with Yoshiro. So mm -hmm. this program uh, is anti-isolationist. So in that vein, I think we are kind of expected to view it positively. Mm -hmm. Though I don't know if you do view it positively, because I don't know if I view it positively. How did you feel? Yeah. That? yeah. So in my mind, if uh, Mume at the end of the novel dies, or if he leaves Japan, in either case, it's, it's bittersweet, but it's still not entirely bad, because I I share this anti-isolationist view, and I think that it's a kind of noble self-sacrifice that he's chosen to to die to do something good for his country. So for me, even if it means dying or being separated from his great grandfather, I don't see it as an unhappy ending. I see it as an optimistic ending. I think this goes to the two titles that this book has, because if you like this title of The Emissary, it's actually quite positive, I'd say, mm -hmm. maybe. But if you think this novella or novel should be titled The Last Children of Tokyo, it's actually much darker. Mm. Mm. So you, you think that both titles that are being used for this work are equally valid? I'm not sure, because I, yes, I do think they are equally valid because I don't think we are given any uh, tipping of the scales in mm -hmm. one direction or another. I don't know if we are meant to read the ending as a tragic ending or a mm. non-tragic ending, okay. but I like 
I think if I had to choose, I, I would lean 51% the last children of Tokyo. Mm. Really? I'm, I'm the yeah. opposite. Why? I'm like yeah. maybe 75% the emissary. Why do you like the emissary more? The reason why I like it is because it's more poetic in the sense that it doesn't put too fine a point on what the plot and major themes of the novel are. In fact, if I saw a book on a shelf with the title The Emissary, I might not be so inclined to pick it up because it sounds like kind of a <laughs> snooze fest. When I see The Last Children of Tokyo, I don't know anything about the publication history of this novel, but I could imagine that being more of the publisher's choice to kind of tart the novel up a little bit to get people excited because it is much more exciting. Why are there a few children in Tokyo? What's happened to Tokyo? Who knows? Better read this book and find out. So to me, I like that the emissary is a little bit more oblique in its description of the novel. It's more mysterious. Yeah. I I liked that maybe until that, that two-thirds mark, this concept of emissary isn't really talked about very much, uh, if at all. And so I, I remember thinking halfway through that, is this the plot? Is We don't even know what the title means yet. Where is this mm -hmm. going? And I kind of loved that that it meanders through the plot uh, and it doesn't really, the title doesn't come in until way late in the book. Um, yeah. And by the time that it does, it, it has weight to it. Whereas last children of Tokyo, I, I, it's a little too on the nose, I think for me. Yeah. I think I'm being convinced. I think I might go 51% the other way now. <laughs> I do agree, though, James, that The Emissary is more positive, and The Last Children of Tokyo definitely, I mean, it tells you all you need to know right there. This is a dark idea. Yeah, well, I think they represent two different ideas that are present in the novel, which is what caused me to lean the other way initially. The Emissary sort of puts Mume on a pedestal, uh, Mume is the emissary, and it shows you how important he is to mm. Yoshiro. Whereas the last children of Tokyo, it's saying he's not special. He is just one of many last children. Here's an example. Um, so initially, I just thought he is a placeholder for all the other children. Whereas the emissary kind of says, okay, this novel isn't about all the children. It is about Mume and his relationship to Yoshiro. That's sort of why I didn't like the the title The Last Children of Tokyo, but more because The Last Children of Tokyo sounds more documentarian to me. It sounds broader than the novel actually shows us. Does that make sense? We're, like we we really yeah. only see Mume. Here I want to open this up with a little bit more historical background. I had seen on Wikipedia, actually, that the original Japanese title of the novel is Kentoshi, which actually is much more directly, literally related to the emissary. And actually, this word Kentoshi in Japanese history is used to refer to the Japanese missions to Tang Dynasty, China when they went to China to learn a lot about their art and culture and technology, which seems to me very, very closely related to what we see happening in this novel. So I think that Kentoshi and The Emissary much more closely connect to this novel than The Last Children of Tokyo. Yeah, and it also gives importance to the mission. I think this idea of a cultural transfer, you know, it's, it's, mm -hmm. it's sort of in the whole novel, right? Yeah. Um, right. Yoshiro is a writer and he runs into various non-Japanese people. Marika isn't a Japanese name, right? It's, it sounds like a German name. Marika's not German, though. 
Marika is but Japanese. But it doesn't sound like a Japanese name, is it? Hmm. I think it can be a Japanese name. Yeah. Okay. Um, but there is the sense that Yoshiro is very anti-isolationist, that he uh, is much more worldly than the world he is currently in. So in that way, it, it represents the novel more, like the, the fact that his great, great grandson might go abroad and be a symbol of that cultural transfer. I think it's more powerful. So I, I'm I'm changing my mind. I'm leaning the other <laughs> way now. You guys have pressured me into doing it. Yes, I'm on team emissary. There's speaking of uh, him being a writer and and focusing on that. Um, I think you wanted to talk about this a little bit, but language plays a huge role in this book. Um, not just the playfulness of it, but the words in other languages. I, I was really curious about how this works in Japanese, because there's a lot of things that seem like they would be they seem very natural in English, like the play between optical and octopi, uh, or well, this is this is more of a general one. But the idea of selling a language to a foreign country, I, I'm still turning that over in my head. What that's supposed to entail? Well, you can see it right now in the English as a foreign language industry. There are lots of people who work in that industry and earn quite a bit of money teaching other people the English language. And I think that it's a kind of cultural imperialism that I think I at least could read in this novel. Sure. Uh, I took it more of a literal sense, though, like um, like when... when uh, What's which island was it that is uh, against selling their language? Uh, Okinawa. Okinawa, that's right. Um, I took it that Okinawa. Uh, now maybe I'm wrong, but I took it that maybe Okinawa, if they were to sell the Okinawan language, that they don't mm -hmm. have the rights to it anymore, that it doesn't belong to them anymore, but. I can see what you mean, that maybe it's just an exporting rather than an actual giving away rights of. Yeah, I think in the world of this novel, language is a much more kind of legislated thing where people have the ability to use a certain set of words or they do not. And people would respect that law, even if it's not their country's law. So perhaps in this world if somebody hasn't given you rights, if you haven't licensed the English language, you can't use that language, even if you know it. It's much more of a commodity. Right. I guess in this world, we do have Yoshiro constantly telling Mume about English words that he can't use anymore because English is banned. So that goes along with that. Yeah, it's just, it's interesting that people would respect that. Like, <laughs> yeah. if people in India know the Okinawan language, are they going to say, well, we haven't paid for this, so we're not going to use it. It's the right thing to do. Hmm. Well, we talked about how the title was translated, and I think the translation in this book was fantastic. Like, I, I give Margaret Mitsutani five out of five stars. What did you guys think about the translation? I agree. I think it was really well done. If you have the ebook that I'm looking at, at the very end, it explains a few of the kind of Japanese jokes that Tawada makes, and it explains how they were actually done in the translation to preserve some of the... Uh... Well, actually, no, I wouldn't say this is necessarily a sign that it's been well done, because actually she couldn't come up with a good way to transfer the same joke into English so she accomplishes it with footnotes. But at the same time, I feel like that's a better thing to do rather than kind of making a, a shitty joke that doesn't really capture the essence of the original joke. But in either case, it shows that she's a sensitive translator who takes her time and respects the reader. In my version, there are two footnotes. Yeah, I only have two footnotes. Is that... Yeah. 
I mean, in a 96 page novel, if you have two times where you encounter something that you can't really translate and you just have to use a footnote, I think that that's showing that Tawada is using some pretty sophisticated wordplay. I agree, but it also, I think, shows that the translation is pretty excellent, that it's a pretty funny book. Yeah. And the fact that those jokes uh, and wordplay come across so well throughout and only need two footnotes at the end, that's that's pretty good. All right, well, we covered a lot of ground here, so I think we should uh, enter the break. Welcome back. Sam, can you start off our discussion? Sure. Uh, So this book is largely a linear chart of a single day in Yoshiro's life with uh, Mume, uh, peppered heavily with excursions into the past, both recent and deep. While the plot moves in a fairly straight line, the story winds around over bumps and hills through time and space like a toddler, Mm -hmm whose attention shifts with each new passing shiny object. Many of the reviews that I read were very critical of the book. Despite the praise for the language, they faulted the plot for being too simple or awkward in its pacing and structure. Did you see this as a problem while you were reading? I did notice this as a feature of the novel, but I wasn't troubled by it. Um, As I mentioned before, it was a little bit difficult to read, but in an enjoyable way. Like, you had to pay attention to it, because if you were reading kind of not paying full attention, you'd kind of get to a part where you're like, wait, what happened? Why are we talking about this? And then you have to go back a few sentences to figure out how you got there. So it just requires more active reading than other novels might. I did see it as a problem, but not a huge problem. I think that The fact that the emissary, the idea of the emissary comes in so late in the book is kind of problematic for me. Um, I think that it doesn't fully realize its potential. This book, I mean. I don't think... This is why I mentioned earlier that I thought it was maybe incomplete and that it could use another fourth or another fifth of page space to fully realize what's going on. Mm. Well, what did you think, Sam? I kind of liked that awkwardness. At, at first, it was it was just awkwardness for me. And it felt like I was always standing on rocky ground. But when, it, when I kind of got used to that, I started to love it and kind of lean into the curves as they came. Mm. Um, It reminded me a lot of one of my favorite books is uh, a book called Invisible Cities that doesn't really have a plot. It's a series of vignettes. There is a through line, just like there's a through line here with a single day in the life of Yoshiro and Mume. But the people that I recommended that book to tended to either love it for that strangeness, that awkwardness, or hate it because of the lack of plot. And I was thinking about the same thing here, that I could see this book splitting people into two camps, people that are deeply concerned with plot and people that are able to forgive that and look past it. Well, I think it's two separate issues uh, that are bringing being critiqued here. One is the awkwardness in pacing, specifically. Um, I didn't see those reviews, but I'm assuming 
some of it has to do with that, what I referenced earlier in my copy, it's page uh, 90, 91, where you have Yoshiro uh, and Marika, they just had dinner together, and then it goes on a tangent about Yoshiro writing a story, and then it switches to Marika's point of view. The fact that we don't really get her point of view for much of the book, and all of a sudden we do, uh, it is kind of jarring. I and I also find the fact that the emissary comes in so late, it's a bit jarring. Like that's mm -hmm. not as jarring as this kind of point of view shift, but it is jarring in another way. That so that's the other problem. If, and I love this book, so when I say problem, I mean it could possibly be smoothed over, and it could be an even better book. But I, I do think the plot is problematic because it comes in so late uh, that I feel like it's incomplete in a way. Like, it could be better realized. Mm -hmm. Well, I was going to say here, having read another one of her novels, I feel like I can point to this as part of her style. And I think that for other novelists, they have a more structural approach to plotting a novel where you can see how different events and different descriptions and ideas subordinate themselves to central ideas and central events. And I think in this novel, rather than if we use the metaphor of building a house with a structure and a foundation, what she's going for is rather than a structure, she's going for kind of a fog. And all of the description in the novel of all of these different ideas and events doesn't really build up to something that we see as the center of the novel, but rather gives us this kind of mist of feelings and emotions. Right. I, my critique isn't with that overall structure. Um, and I, I do seem to recall discussing this in grad school about how like this is a more feminine way of telling a story uh, as opposed to sort of the inverted check mark, which is very, um, some people say is very masculine. For me, the issue is that the emissary, the idea of the emissary isn't developed enough. Mm -hmm. that's why I don't I wanted to see more of it and mm -hmm. why I didn't like that it came in so late that felt like the difference to me between this being a novella versus a novel that it's yes it kind yeah of, that's why I mentioned it earlier yeah. right mm -hmm. and that that's why it was okay to me I didn't really want it any longer than it was um, it certainly could be but I don't think it's missing anything. I don't think it's lacking anything as it is. She's building a world. It's much more important for her to build this world than it is for her to tell a story, per se. The, the story is definitely there, but plot doesn't need to be there, per se. Well, my issue with it is that the emissary strikes one note very strongly which is we get how if Mume becomes an emissary, it has this catastrophic emotional effect on Yoshiro. We totally get that. That is really beautifully done. But all the other consequences of that is not clear. Like what this does for Japanese society, for example, or uh, what effect this might have on others or the other countries in the world i mean i'm spitballing because it could be anything but what it is is it's only one thing whereas so much of the book the strength is you have this central movement uh, of their connection like the connection between yoshiro and mume that is so strong but you also have all this other underlying tensions of living in a post cataclysmic world I don't see that with the emissary. I think it only strikes that one note, which is why I feel like it's not fully explored. So I have a question here for both of you. Um, it seems like, James, you've kind of isolated the emissary, the program itself, as something that you want more of. Now, obviously, the title indicates that this is a central thing, but besides the title, why do you feel like you want more of that? Why is that the thing that should be given more space. Because this idea that Mube will be taken away from Yoshiro, it, it's ever-present, and it's the source of his, his anxiety. And you might even extrapolate that it's the source of Japanese anxiety, that the future will not be there. 
And so that's what this program represents in a way. It's this taking away of the future. At the same time, it's the opening up and perhaps the um, presentation of another future. So that's really important. And I think that by the end of it, I really get the personal aspect of that, but I don't get the Marika aspect of it. I, I want to see more of that. Part of the tension for me was that that sense of not knowing. We don't know what happened to Japan. We don't know exactly why they've decided to isolate themselves. And that that tension with Mume uh, leaving and not knowing exactly how that's going to help, how that's going to serve Japan, that goes in, in line for me with that tension of this unease throughout the whole book of not knowing exactly what's happening at any given moment. Maybe it strikes the same note, like you're saying, but that note is a very strong one to me, that nothing, we don't know what's going on. We're only given these little bits and pieces. And so for the emissary program to be that uh, amorphous was okay for me. It, it left me grasping, but I, I think that was a nice feeling to have. It created a good tension for me. Did you guys feel the same way about, um, and I don't know exactly how to pronounce her name, but uh, Sway Rim, the neighbor? I didn't think that she needed to be more expanded than she was. I think that she lives in this novel like everything else in this novel as one thing among and among others and i don't think that anything being kind of amplified would improve the novel i think that if she were more amplified and we saw more of her it would have the potential to dominate other things i agree and i think she's treated as this strange you know, her eyes are a little far apart, and uh, when he first meets her, he's entranced with her. Mume is entranced with her. I think that there's a possibility that might fade if we get if we get too much of her, if she becomes a fully fleshed character. Okay, so we were talking about how there's a lot that we don't know in this novel or novella, and. One of the things that interested me was that we actually, in this book about cataclysm and uh, Japan in a post-apocalyptic setting, we only really get one death, possibly two if you count the ending as a death, which is, the death is Mume's mother, who was not named. And in this death, um, only Yashiro witnesses her body, but it's not described to us. Uh, Tawada just notes that Yoshiro gasps, and he's unable to believe what he was seeing. So this kind of reminded me of the metamorphosis, where, um, at least in a lot of creative writing classes, where when they teach the metamorphosis by Kafka, they highlight the fact that you don't have to explain everything. So Samsa in the metamorphosis uh, transforms into like a bug cockroach type figure, but we don't actually know what that person looks like or what the creature looks like. So we kind of see that here. We know that Tawada is a fan of Kafka. And then we also, if we zoom out, we get sort of the apocalyptic event, which is possibly some kind of uh, Fukushima fallout event. But we don't actually know what it is. We don't ever get told. So why do you guys think she does this? And do you think this is effective? Like I was saying just a second ago, it contributes to the, the sense of unease for me. Uh, I want to know more of what happened, but I think that makes it more powerful not knowing. I think that definitely increases the tension more because it, it, it doesn't sit comfortably with me. It makes me curious, but it's more than curiosity. It, it makes me uncomfortable, but in a good way. I think that uncomfortableness is something that she's playing with a lot and 
yeah, I, I think that's a really good choice. Yeah, I would agree with Sam here. I don't think that presenting description to the reader is always desirable or even generally desirable. I think that if you can create a mood where the reader wants to know and you just feed the reader just a little bit of description, it's much more evocative than telling the reader explicitly what things look like. I think if it was more focused on, say, like Fukushima, then you could say it's a book about Fukushima. But because it's not, it, it's a book about environmental cataclysm, which in my mind makes it more powerful um, in, in a lot of ways. I don't know if you guys felt the same way. Yeah, I think that being broad is, to me at least, always more engaging than specificity when it comes to works of art in general. To be broad is much more complex and full of meaning than to point specifically to any particular thing. Yeah, if we were, if this were a book about Fukushima, it would be a very, very different book. Um, it would be, well, I mean, this is just a guess, but I have a feeling it would be pulling more intentionally at your heartstrings rather than allowing the, the language to be more playful and expansive. Uh, building this world that doesn't exist the way we see it. Um, it allows us to, you know, our imaginations to go wild rather than telling us this is the way it is. What do you guys think generally about this trope of having an unnamed horror, or perhaps not just unnamed, but undescribed, like an indescribable horror? I don't know if it's necessarily being used here in the novel. It's undescribed, but not necessarily because it's horrific, but because so many things are kind of left vague. And I think that in general, if we're saying that it's just so horrific that it kind of boggles the mind, I think that it does speak to something real psychologically that when we have that experience that you might call the experience of the sublime that we do have this inability to accurately articulate what's happening to us at that moment so i think that that's something that's psychologically valid in fiction but i don't know if that's actually what's happening in this novel i think that this novel is just an instance of kind of thoroughgoing vagary is vagary the right word? I don't know. Vagueness. Yes, either. Yeah, I would. I actually maybe would have preferred if it did verge on the sublime a bit because he does. Uh, sorry, she does. Tawada does. Sort of motion toward it uh, later on when she's describing this. On in my copy, page seventy-two, he re-remembers the event. He's saying the body in his memory continued to mature. He says that the sight of his daughter-in-law didn't shock him nearly as much. The body, in fact, was rather beautiful. Later, however, he found it impossible to reproduce exactly what he had seen, for in his memory, the body continued to change. The center of the face grew sharper, changing into a bird's beak. And he um, talks about how she kind of transforms into a bird-like figure in his memory. So what do you make of this, that... You have um, an event fixed. In fact, she died and she looked a certain way, but in his storytelling of it, it kind of shifts and it mutates into something beautiful. This is sort of tangential, but there's a lot of animal imagery throughout this book, especially with birds. And it's interesting to me that there aren't any animals anymore. There we know that there are some insects and that there are worms and I think some birds and spiders and fish, I guess. There are dogs for rent. There are dogs to rent. So there, there's a handful of things that exist, but most of them aren't wild anymore. And the things that are wild are very rare and generally things that you can't touch or eat. So this goes along with what you're talking about, memory. There are so many things 
so many similes and metaphors comparing to what things used to be, you know, that people are compared to birds, birds that no longer exist in this world. I think that there's something there about how memory works for Yoshiro, how memory works for a human grasping at things that they used to be familiar with that now are very unfamiliar. Yeah, I think that that's probably relevant to what James was asking about here, the experience of looking at a dead body and the memory of that experience, because I think that this is one of the prime examples of abjection, where you experience something that's just so unfamiliar and just so unsettling that it's very difficult to to think about it clearly and definitely very difficult to remember accurately. So the memory of the experience grows in difficult to contain ways when you think back on it. On the one hand, I like that she doesn't present it to us as just positive or just negative, because she could very easily show us this example as humanity's folly uh, because obviously because of radiation or whatever happened due to humanity's uh, mistakes in the past, this person died. But the fact that he kind of reimagines her in a positive way kind of complicates that reading of it, which is, you know, what makes it interesting to me and what led to this question is that she doesn't give us an easy reading of this situation. It, it makes, she makes it more complicated when he transforms it into something beautiful. But in our heart of hearts, we want it to be ugly because it is something that humanity did to poison Japan and that led to this death. Does that make sense? Yeah, this death feels a lot like the rest of the book to me, where, like you said, it's not a good or bad thing, even though I think generally we could probably agree that whatever has happened to Japan is bad. There seems to be beauty in the things that are happening, too, or at least there's beauty in Yoshiro's life still. But we're given these two specialists that work at the hospital and even they can't agree one of them describes what's happening to the body as unwelcome changes and that the body should be cremated immediately and the other one wants to dissect the body and learn more about these changes so not only do we not get to see the body but we're given this very strange dichotomy sort of of even more elusiveness uh but in such terms that not only do we not get to see it we have no idea what they could possibly be looking at talking about bodies and mutations and maybe unsettling bodies i think this leads into my major concern with this novel i see that not just bodies are mutating but the whole world seems to be kind of in revolt. Everything is upended, and whatever kind of semblance of natural order the reader might presume is not, not a guaranteed thing in this world. And I think it's especially true concerning bodies where we have the old, like Yushiro, who are growing more and more vital, and the young, like Mume, are sickly and weak. And throughout this novel, we find vivid and grotesque bodily images, like when Mume's bloody teeth are falling out, and the blood smeared on his face is like pomegranate pulp. Not only bodies, but everything is destabilized, and sex and language and familial relations are destabilized, like I mentioned earlier with uh, Marika, or Marika, rather, uh, even down to the perception of light and darkness. How does this chaos relate to a rapidly aging post-Fukushima Japan? I don't know. I don't know if it. Uh, we'd be remiss to say it. It doesn't relate at all to Fukushima uh, mm -hmm. or to post Fukushima Japan. But I, I don't know. I, I don't know what we're supposed to take from that. I, one thing I can get from it is that life itself is very uncertain, and 
but that's a very vague sentiment and I I don't I don't really feel comfortable ascribing too many things to it I I was happy just to go along with this uh, the pretty language and the the world building but I do feel like there is something there I just I haven't figured out what yet I think that question is it meant to relate to post Fukushima Japan I mean it's related to what we were talking about earlier right the fact that she doesn't explicitly say it's due to nuclear fallout that we can surmise I think is a conscious effort to not make it about post Fukushima Japan I, I think it's to me it's a more general criticism of environmental neglect rather than post Fukushima Japan it's mm -hmm. Uh, contemporary Japan in general. Yeah. I think that she saw that there was a, a tendency with this kind of novel to hit the nail too squarely on the head. So she drew back a little bit because she knew that if she leaned too heavily into that straight reading of the cataclysm that we see in the novel, we would leave a lot of other interesting readings on the table. So I think that you're right that it's not pointing specifically to that, but what do you think we can say, just knowing a little bit about Japan and contemporary society, do you think that there is a relation that we can bring to this novel? I don't know, because I feel like I don't know enough about Japan to comment. But mm -hmm. what I, I will say, what I really enjoyed about this novel is that even though it is so Japanese, it feels and it reads so universal because the heart of it is this relationship between an elderly relative and um, his charge that may die at any moment. Like that is the heart of the novel that feels that that's very universal. So in, in some ways, I feel like even though this is set in Japan and it talks about contemporary Japanese issues, or it perhaps not talks about, but it kind of touches on it. What makes it great in my mind is that it's so universal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, there were definitely times when I kind of forgot that this was written in Japanese. Uh, it felt very universal. I think this question about, um, the aging population coupled with this isolationist stance uh, is reminiscent of a Japan's immigrant policy where they are rapidly aging, but they're refusing to allow immigrants in. Well, they do have immigrants for certain types of work. So in convenience stores, last time I was in Japan, I noticed that actually there are quite a few Indonesian workers in convenience stores. And to call back to convenience store woman, actually one of the workers in that novel was Vietnamese. I think I think there are students. So if you're a student, you're allowed to work for a certain number of hours, but you're not allowed mm -hmm. to uh, immigrate to Japan the way you mm -hmm. could to uh, another Western country. Mm -hmm. The reason why I was really drawn to this particular aspect of the novel, this kind of world in chaos is because to me it seems to always harken back to the idea of naturalness and the good old days. I feel like in this novel, especially looking at the world through Yashiro's eyes, there's always this idea of a natural order where things were right and things made sense that existed somewhere in the distant past. And I'm wondering if we can read this novel as in any way a kind of critique on maybe modernity or rationalism because it seems like there is a kind of uh, degeneration of everything that we would say is natural and good or we might presume at least is natural and good in terms of families caring for each other and things being stable in terms of the environment and the natural world and the animal world, because 
in this novel, people can't even look at light and see light. They sometimes see darkness and sometimes the weather sometimes really feels very hot and then it shifts to being very cold. It seems like there's always in the back of our minds a normal thing or a natural thing that we're longing for. I do see it as a critique of modernity, especially when Yoshiro is talking about uh, Tomo and how he set aside money for Tomo to go to school, and it turns out all of that's useless. Um, and how you know the the housing market in Tokyo totally collapsed, and the conventional wisdom was to buy in Tokyo as a good because it's a good investment. Like this idea that there's a, in our contemporary society, these are the things you should do, and this is conventional wisdom. And all that gets upended, I feel like, yeah, it is definitely a critique of contemporary society. I don't know if it's so much a looking back, though. I, I don't really see that aspect of it. Well, I don't think that the, the example of the property in Tokyo is a really a critique, necessarily, because I think it's a situation that made buying in Tokyo irrelevant, really what I think I would see as problematic in this novel that if we live in a world where buying in a large city like Tokyo doesn't make sense and we have to abandon cities like Tokyo that's the real problem like why do we have to abandon huge parts of our world we have characters like Amana uh, Yoshiro's daughter who abandoned Tokyo to go live and work on a farm and we get little snippets or we, we, yeah, I guess they're little snippets, uh, assumptions of what her life might be like. We get visions that it might be idyllic, but then that's also paired with that it's like a factory and that they hardly get a break. So it seems like at, at the same time, kind of in the same way that we're given this uh, neither good nor bad uh, view of the world or of Tomo's wife, we we get this image that it would be nice to return to a simpler way of life, and that th that's what's actually important. That you know, working a an honest job where you pick fruit and you live off the land that that would be really nice. But it also sounds like it's not really that nice at all. That it's grueling work that it's fiercely guarded. You know, they don't even ship their goods outside of the island, or very rarely do they ship off, off the island. So I, I don't know if it's a full critique. What I would say here is that, at least for me, and I don't want to say that this is Tawada's intention at all, but when I read this novel, what I took away from it is that a lot of times in contemporary discourse, when people say, oh, well, this is natural, it's good. A lot of people nowadays are kind of pushing against that idea and saying, well, no, you can't really assert that. Natural isn't necessarily good. And I think that this novel, for me at least, is saying that there is something valuable in being natural. Um, in what context are you using natural? Do you mean like hiking or do you mean like natural ingredients? Like what do you mean by natural? Not in terms of activities or things, but in terms of a baseline, a point of origin, things that happen and things that exist in a way without any seeming intention, you know, without having to try to make children robust and strong, they grow up robust and strong, without trying to make older people grow weak and eventually die, that's just the way things happen. And I think that the novel presents this kind of longing for what I would see as a kind of natural state of affairs in a, in a particular way to point to, yeah, these are things that are natural, but if they weren't that way, you'd probably feel uneasy. Like, I would feel uneasy to live in a world where young people were so weak and fragile and old people were getting more and more vigorous. That, to me, would seem unpleasant. Do you think this is a warning for, you know, as our 
medicine gets better and people are living longer, longer lives, healthier lives, do you think this is a warning that, hey, let's be careful that we don't go too close to this, this immortalization because it's unnatural, because... Transhumanism. It's making some sort of gesture. I'm not sure if I can articulate exactly what the gesture is, but it is speaking in some way to ideas from posthumanism or transhumanism. I think that it asserts that there is a human nature that is present and valuable. I'm trying to figure out what I think about this idea of a chaotic world here as presented to us, because I don't think that Tawada presents it to us as desirable on any level. She never really makes us comfortable saying, okay, this character is for this, or this character is against this, right? Like every single thing that's given to us, it's kind of given to us in duality. So I, I struggle with saying that generally this chaotic world is presented to us negatively and that there is a natural order to things. But the reason why I struggle with it is because in this novel, she always presents us with both light and dark, if that makes sense. Yeah, I think I agree with you that it's not pure evil. It's not something that we can point to and say, this is bad. But I think that, as I was mentioning before, it's kind of working as kind of a fog, a fog of description and a fog of meaning. And the general breeze of that fog is pushing me, at least, towards seeing this as a negative situation. Even though there are still elements of beauty in it, it's in general, in my reading, a negative situation. I think I'd agree. It's it's so nostalgic for the past. It's so, even though no, we have, I think so, and nostalgic for Yoshiro's past. Not Not nostalgic for capital T, capital P, the past. Um, you got that but... backwards. Capital TP. <laughs> <laughs> um, but y Yoshiro is constantly lapsing back into how things used to be and how, again, not, not how the world used to be, but how his world used to be. You know, he, he it seems like he misses things uh, or longs for the ability to die uh, that he knows that he can't have. You know, it, it, it comes across with all the the words that he uses with Mume that he, he teaches Mume these words accidentally and then says, oh, but you can't use them. Uh, it comes across with the fruit that he makes a point of buying from Mume, even if Mume can't really process it. Yeah, or like, for example, the rental dog service mentioned early on <laughs> in the novel, like... In order for that joke to land with the reader, the reader has to understand the idea of owning a pet dog. And mm. to see the humor in having to rent a dog, it requires a certain sort of understanding that it's much more desirable to own a pet rather than to rent a pet. Yeah. All right. So after that spirited discussion, I think we are due for a break. So let's take a break. We'll be right back. Okay, welcome back. So we talked earlier about how we all love this book. And even though I critiqued it mildly, I, I loved 10 out of 10, nine tenths of this book. It's just the last tenth that I kind of eh, felt like I needed a little bit more, uh, more from. But this book, as we mentioned earlier, did not get um, universal acclaim. It only received 3.5 stars on Goodreads. And we talked about perhaps that's a different audience than what this book is intended for. Um, who do you think is the audience of this book? 
the emissary. I think it's definitely for serious, quote unquote, serious readers, probably the the grad school set, the MFA set. This is for readers who like fiction that plays with itself. I think that if you go into this novel and you're the type of reader who wants a suspenseful thriller and for things to be set up and then resolved, you're definitely not going to be satisfied. It straddles that fine line because it's fiction that plays with itself, but it's not masturbatory. Yeah, this is not a... If you're looking for a plot, a linear plot where things happen in A, B, C order, you're not going to get that here. But the people that would be dissuaded from that, yeah, I don't think they would be picking up this book anyway. Well, I think it's very academic in terms of the audience that will appreciate it. I don't think that it's dry in any sense. I think it's actually very funny. And I think that if readers give it a chance and are willing to kind of think twice about it, they might see how funny it is. Yeah, you mentioned earlier, Ed, uh, that it requires a little bit more work or more patience. I think that's true, but it's also not a difficult read at all. This was one of the most fun things I've read in years. And yeah, it, it was hard for me to put it down. Yeah, and we didn't really talk about it that much, but the humor is present throughout. It's it's kind of a dark humor, but it, it is very funny. It is. It's It's muted. It's not like laugh out loud hilarious, but it's... <laughs> it plays with itself, like he had said. It's sad humor, right? Like you you want to laugh, but at the same time, you always are aware of the fact that you're um, reading a dystopic novel, which is very different from other dystopic novels. Oh, would you call this black humor? I might not. I don't think it's as dark as James is making out. I think it's more absurd than dark Mm -hmm. it's kind of wry absurd humor yeah yeah well to that point just to give the listener kind of a touchstone sam you had mentioned in our private discussion that it reminded you a bit of george saunders i'm thinking especially like the morgue that he visits is called the rest in peace deep freeze (laughs) i think that that kind of absurd kind of uh i'm almost call it a parody of uh consumer culture but like just giving things ridiculous names is something that would appeal to readers who like Saunders. Yeah, I agree. I forgot that I had said that, but yeah, I think readers of George Saunders would love uh, Tawana. So, yeah, since you've read uh, a few of her other novels, would you recommend this one over the others? Uh, so I've read in total three of her works. Uh, this novel the novel The Bridegroom Was a Dog, and the collection of stories called Where Europe Begins. And I think that the novel and The Bridegroom Was a Dog can be thought of as a pair. They work really well together. They both have a very similar style, that kind of very quick stream of ideas that I really enjoyed. Uh, Where Europe Begins is different not only in its format, because they're short stories, but also because a lot of those works were actually written in German rather than being written in Japanese. And I don't think that there's anything clunky about her prose. I think that she's very, very skillful in any language. But I do think that there is a subtle difference between her writing in German and her writing in Japanese, even though, of course, we're seeing all of this through the lens of her translator, who's translating into English. I still can notice a small difference. I wonder if it's a translating issue, too. Not not the fact that the translators are bad, but that it's two different translators. Yeah, I, I think that it, it might be the translation issue. It's also just to do with the very Japanese nature of uh, the bridegroom was a dog. I think it's more Japanese than this. And you had mentioned before that you thought that this novel wasn't especially Japanese, but I do have that kind of, to again talk about fogs, I do have the fog of Japanese-ness on this novel as well. But in general, I would say that her novels are 
much more appealing to me than the stories, but I think all of them are worthwhile. So even though this novel, The Emissary, won the National Book Award, uh, I don't think it got a lot of press. Um, Do you think that it will gain more of a readership in the coming years? I don't know, but I really hope so. This made me want to immediately dive in and read more of her work. That doesn't happen for me this starkly as it did here. That That's pretty rare for me. In the previous episode with uh, Convenience Store Woman, um, Sam, you talked about how everyone was recommending that book, and I would not recommend that book. But this book I would recommend to almost everybody. Which is interesting, then, that I'm not seeing this as much. I don't see... Uh, the emissary everywhere and I don't know why I think that this is one of those works that it's not for everyone and that's that's okay and I think that it benefits actually by not trying too hard to appeal to everybody it, it has its own lane and it sticks to that lane and it does what it sets out to do very well but you know as I mentioned earlier if you want plots to do the things that plots normally do you're not going to enjoy this novel. And I think that if she made any kind of moves towards making it more conventional in that sense, it wouldn't be as good as it is. So I think it's fine. And the audience that it has, like all three of us loved it. I think that it will have a small but devoted audience in the future. All right. So then that concludes our discussion on The Emissary. Uh, Next episode will be our mini-series wrap-up, where we discuss this book, and also Coffee on the Shore and Convenience Store Women. Thank you for listening. If you have feedback for us, you can find us at CanonicalPod on Twitter. We'd love to hear from you. Till next time, happy reading. We'll talk to you soon.